This is the Sphere computer, and this is a Southwest Technical Products alphanumeric printer PR40. We're going to get these two machines talking to each other, and along the way, look at the magic bit of early computing technology that allows this communication to happen. Then we'll see a useful application of a printer just like this. Welcome back. This is one of an occasional series of videos about Sphere Corporation and the early Sphere computers from Utah. These Motorola 6800-based systems were not outrageously popular, but they were very early and significant integrated microcomputers. Although we'll be using the Sphere, the real star of the show today is this wild little printer, the Southwest Technical PR40 from 1976. This unit is here on the desk, courtesy of a friend of mine. I've repaired it and got it working, and we'll have the true 1970s experience of connecting to it and making it print some things for us. Printers were not home devices in the mid-1970s. You could buy a, quote, real printer, and Sphere themselves had one they would sell you, but they were commercial units and cost over $1,000. Jumping into this gap came Southwest Technical Products Corporation, a company out of San Antonio, Texas. They produced electronics and computers as kits to be built by enthusiasts, and in 1976 introduced the PR40 printer kit for the princely sum of $250. As you can see, it's a bit of an oddball machine. Most obviously, it doesn't produce full-size documents. Instead, it uses a 4-inch roll of paper and can print only 40 characters on each line. But it did work, and it was useful, and it was cheap, relatively. A very cool little device. If you'd like to see more about how this printer fit into Southwest Technical's lineup at the time, there's a good video from Tech Time Traveler that goes into that, and it's linked below. But the printer wasn't only used, or even intended to be used, by people with the Southwest Technical Computer System. Many Sphere users, enthusiasts themselves, bought this printer and connected it up to their Sphere computers. The documentation from Southwest Technical explains what you need to do to drive it from whatever your computer was, and in that era, users were often technically experienced and expected to be able to figure out how to make that work. We will do that today. First, let's take a look at what this printer is. It is very simple in design and construction. This whole bit on top, the actual print mechanism, is a third-party part that was manufactured by a company called LRC. This mechanism was also used in adding machines and other commercial print systems, so it is not unique to this printer. Uh, it is an impact printer mechanism, the simplest version of a dot matrix design, with a single vertical row of seven pins in the print head. The flower of cylinders on the back of the printhead is the set of seven solenoid coils that drive each pin independently. As the printhead sweeps across the page, the electronics trigger the individual solenoids, which force pins to fire, striking the ink ribbon and then the paper, causing characters to appear. The printhead, or carriage, sweeps back and forth by the rotation of this plastic barrel with an elliptical cam track in it. It's a cool, very simple design that relies on smart electronics to drive it. Southwest Technical put those electronics down below in this sheet metal box. All of the timing, the specific form of the printed characters, and the interface with the host computer are in the circuitry underneath and inside. Most important for our project today though is this, the input connection that sends data in to the printer to be printed. This looks a little odd, but it's just a 12-pin Molex socket. You have to plug something into this that sends the right signals in the right ways. There was no standard interconnector protocol for this sort of device at that time. So how do we know how to do that? Fortunately, it's all in the manual. You may be able to tell that this is a parallel connection. The printer simply accepts one 7-bit ASCII character at a time using seven data signal lines. Most interestingly are the other two signal lines we need to attach. One of them is a data ready signal, or strobe, that tells the printer that the ASCII data on the seven data lines is valid and the printer can go ahead and accept it. The other is a response line from the printer back to the computer, telling the computer that it has accepted the character and is ready for the next one. But now the important question, how does that connect to a sphere or indeed to any computer? The answer to that question is a historically significant computer chip. Here are the recollections of its designer, Chuck Peddle. Quote, the most important thing I did at Motorola and the most important thing I ever did for the personal computer industry was, I knew that this thing called a microprocessor is just a power burner. 
You can sit there and make it run power, but it doesn't do anything. If you want to make it do something, if you want to make it run a copier, if you want to make it be a cache register, you need an IO function. So we invented a thing called a PIA, which had programmable registers and it was in memory mapped space. And we put the structure in we needed to get an interrupt in. And we could get an interrupt off from the edges and you could make one edge drive another. We put some really nice programming features in it. And we did that, they patented it, and everybody in the world still uses that structure, programmable input-output registers. If you look at almost all the architectures today, you'll see a piece of PIA. Chuck Peddle is the legendary engineer who worked on the 6800 chipset at Motorola and then left to design the MOS Technology 6502. In his own words, his most important contribution was not a CPU, but this PIA. That's the Peripheral Interface Adapter, or to some people the Programmable Interface Adapter, or even the Parallel Interface Adapter. It's a chip that has two stable 8-bit ports and programmable registers on it that let the software configure the ports for input or output and can also drive certain control signals in custom ways. There have been many descendants and copies of the PIA design over the years, but the Sphere is old enough to have the OG part, the 6820 PIA. This is how we're going to connect the Southwest Technical Printer to the Sphere. Every Sphere computer has at least one PIA right on the CPU board. This chip has two ports, and one of them, port A, is usually reserved on the sphere for keyboard input through the socket marked X4. But port B is open and available, and we will connect the printer to that port using socket X5. Taking a look at the schematics, the signals from the PIA are connected directly to this socket, eight data bits, here marked PB0 through PB7, and two control signals, CB1 and CB2. Also available at socket X5 is five volts, ground, and the system reset line. We will use the ground, but we don't need the others. The conversation between the computer and printer is going to look like this. The computer says, here's an ASCII character that I want you to print, in this example, the letter A. Then the computer triggers the data strobe, indicating that the data is ready to print. The printer will take some brief time buffering or printing the character. And finally, the printer will indicate that it's ready to accept the next character. And then this process is repeated until everything is printed. Here's that same conversation in the form that we will interface it. The computer presents the ASCII form of the character on the data lines. We are going to use PIA control line 2, or CB2, for the data ready output, which the computer drops low briefly to indicate valid data. We'll use CB1, or PIA control line 1, as an input from the printer for the data accepted signal, which goes high to tell us the printer is ready again. So that's exactly how we will connect socket X5 with the printer's control interface plug. Sphere's DIP socket based interconnect scheme is fiddly and not all that great. So it takes some head scratching to make sure that we are making the right connections at the X5 socket. But here's what it looks like. It's a diagram of the Sphere's PIA socket on the left with the signals on a ribbon cable and where they go uh, on the printer socket on the right. You can see four signals from the sphere are not used, two five volt rails, reset, and bit seven. The printer only understands seven bit ASCII codes anyway. We can wire this all up uh, with a homebrew cable just like this one. There's the 14 pin dip plug for the sphere board and on the other end, a 12 pin Molex plug for the printer. So let's get this connected up. Now our 1976 Duo is complete and looking pretty. But like, now what? How do we even know that this thing is set up correctly? There is a diagnostic program we will run, but even before that, we can try to poke the printer directly using the Sphere's built-in debugger. This is possible because the 6800 architecture uses memory mapped IO. So as long as we know what address that PIA chip is located at, we can read and write to it directly. We fire up the Sphere and enter the debugger. We'll start by opening location F042, which is the address of port B's data register on the PIA. 
It shows value zero, which is telling us since the computer was just reset, that the data lines are configured as inputs by default. We want them to be outputs to the printer, so we change this to FF. Then here we are at location F043, the port B control register. We'll set this to 3F. 3F represents a specific bit pattern that tells the PIA to set certain control states. We are telling the PIA that signal line CB1 will be an input, and we want to know when it goes high. We're also designating CB2 as an output and forcing it to the high value for now. We are also setting the data register to its normal mode. This is our default ready state setup. When we go back to F042, we are looking at the data register, which we will set to 0D. This is the ASCII value for carriage return. It is the only control character the printer understands, so it makes for a good quick test. As soon as we write that value, the printer can see the 0D character. But that CB2 data strobe signal is still set high, so the printer does not know the character is ready to go. So let's change the data strobe to low. We do this by updating the control register to 37, which alters only the bit setting for CB2. And as soon as we do, ta-da! We have successfully sent a carriage return character to the printer, and it has done what we have asked. Next up is the Southwest Technical Diagnostic Program. This is a bit of assembly code included in the manual and designed for the Southwest Technical Computer. Because that system is also a 6800 system, and in fact also uses a 6820 PIA chip to address the printer, this program will work almost perfectly for us. We just need to make a couple address changes for Sphere. Once we do, we can load and run it and see what happens. The program is telling the printer to dump out its complete character set over and over, and so it is. Check out the ribbon spool. Every time the carriage hits the spool on the right, it advances one click. The cool thing is that when the ribbon reaches the end, it will auto-reverse and start advancing in the other direction. To stop it, we can just turn off the printer which also makes sure that no junk is left over in its internal buffer. If you look closely at the output, there are those seven vertical dots that make up all of the characters. So that's the diagnostic, and once that's up and working, the printer is ready to go. But then what? Well, these printers were typically used back in the day to output small assembly or basic program listings. I could modify the Microsoft Basic that I demonstrated in the last video to send its output to this printer. But truth be told, I don't write much code on the Sphere itself. I do my actual programming on a modern system. But there is something that I use this Sphere for that could benefit from a printer. As I mentioned, I'm writing a book, and I like the distraction-free environment I can have by typing into this computer. So I made a little text editor for the Sphere. I called it Scriptor, which is Latin for writer, which I got from Google Translate. This is a word wrapping, full screen, scrolling, cursor controlled text editor. I use this to draft bits of text, which I can save to cassette tape. But now I have a way to make hard copies too. Here's an example. I can type out the beginning of the classic Melville novel Moby Dick, and we can see the editor will do automatic word wrapping and scrolling beyond the screen. Now, if I want to print it out, I can. The Sphere screen is only 32 columns wide, but the printer has 40 columns, so the text gets rewrapped as its output to the printer to make full use of the paper width. Nifty. That's all we have for today. I have really enjoyed getting this printer up and working and showing you the Motorola 6820 PIA. Even if you don't have a Sphere or a PR40 printer, I hope you now have a sense that the PIA and its descendants are powerful and useful tools that might be able to fit in somewhere in your own work. You can find the code for the Scriptor editor as well as information on this printer and how to connect it to a Sphere linked below. Please check out sphere.computer for more information on the computer and to sign up for newsletters and updates. See you next time.